And with this, I say good evening to those on Zoom, to those that are here. Thank you for coming. No clouds tonight. And I want to do a very informal, inofficial welcome. It comes with all modesty. And I acknowledge and honor the high ranking people. First, welcome to the members of Namibia society, then welcome to fellow Namibians and friends of the society, then to the representative of our government and the office of the president. Thank you, James, Mr. Ndjupe. Thank you, Dr. Tobias Bichon-Nims. Thank you, Mrs. Margaret Mertschler for being here and all the way from South Africa. Mr. Marco Raffinetti trying to hide in the back with Rainer Jago. So this hasn't worked out. Her Excellency, the EU ambassador, and we are so glad to have her here. Representatives of other missions, diplomatic corps, government, civil society, research institutions. And if I have forgotten someone, please bear with me. I'll leave it to Mr. Ndupe to later um, introduce the other speakers. For those that are here for the first time, and I beg the members that know the tune to please bear with me for one minute. The Namibia Scientific Society is a members association, will be 100 years old in three years, so if I forget something, that's due to age. And um, we are probably the strongest because we have close to a thousand members. We are truly Namibia in all sectors of society. No affiliation to any political party. No private benefit from all these things as we are NPO, NGO. We focus on the distribution of fact-based information. This is only possible with the support of members. And as you can see, we have a few donors that support us like Paratus, making sure that we have an opt optical fiber line. Thank you, Paratus. Atlas Engineering for giving us the big camera so that we can zoom. And with this, I just want you to note everything is recorded. So mind your words. It will be out there on YouTube, <laughs> noted. We also thank you for being ready to share your presentations because we just feel that this is information that everyone wants to know about. And then um, we have the Minds in Action team. There they are. Thank you for helping us. And the members that come and donate drinks, assist with whatever. Sharing information, focus on fact-based um, details has us trying to bring as much as possible, we have a slogan, Science for Society, and that is for us to understand what is actually happening. We had two presentations already on this topic because when everyone started talking, people said, but what is this about? And I said, well, let's get the facts, all this tip tip and blah, blah. It does not really take us any further, so let's get the facts. We started with Professor Anisha Peters and Dr. Natangwe. Where are they, by the way? Okay, and they um, had the scientific side of it. They are from UNAM's Green Hydrogen Research Institute. Then we had people that raised their opinion in the media, amongst others. We had Dr. Detlo von Erzen. We had um, Jackie Skolz for all the legal framework that goes with such a project or could maybe go with it. Then we had Robert McGregor from Cirrus for bringing up the financial implications. And more and more the question was, can we not get the initiators, developers to please give us the details that are outstanding? So with this, we are so happy to have you, to have Mr. Njupe, Margaret for the Green Hydrogen Association of Namibia. I never knew we had such a thing, to be very honest, so thank you. And the rules for such a panel discussion, everyone may say what he wants to say, as long as it is polite, not insulting, 
and that one person speaks at a time. So with that, yes, let's first have the program. We start with James and he will say how we then go on and then it is Q&A. We will also give a chance to the people on Zoom and I now already know that you know, with all the rain, the walls are coming down, as you can see there, but to be hit by your own flyer or banner is a bit, but still. Okay, and then it is Q&A, and there are always more questions, because so often a statement just brings up even more questions, but I trust that this will take us much further, and so I say thank you and hand over to James. Thank you. Thank you um, so much for having us. The, oh. yeah, thanks a lot for having us. I, I was sitting here and listening to you talk and you said you hadn't heard of uh, the Namibian Green Hydrogen Association before. And you're right, like last year, this time it didn't exist. Um, last year, this time, none of these people thought of being in Namibia. Um, and I suppose that's probably my job today. I'm going to leave it to the scientists to really break down what we've been trying to articulate for you before. But I suppose my job is to just shed a little bit of light of how we got here and why we got here. Um, long story short, uh, of course, you all know that we are in uh, a really, really trying economic space. Uh, tomorrow, our Minister of um, Finance will probably table the most trying budget that we've seen since um, independence. Um, and of course, the president and the government uh, came to the conclusion or certainly have always had the passion to do something um, different, but also to try and crowd in funding and crowd in opportunity that didn't exist. So like the Namibian Green Hydrogen Association that didn't exist, one of the tasks that we got as a team was to try and create new engines of growth. This is what we've called them in HPP2. And when we were conducting our research, um, by the way, research that was um, really amplified by De Beers' support, and I'm happy to say that online, um, using you know, technology and research from Bloomberg, the government came to the conclusion that we had um, an idiosyncratic um, advantage of developing a synthetic fuels industry. Um, of course, grounded in green hydrogen and green ammonia, and that's the way we captured it. So that's really the genesis of all of this. Um, including the Namibian Green Hydrogen Association, which we thought was a good idea for the private sector to have an association that would represent this new synthetic fuels industry that we were trying to incubate. And I say that because it's very important for people to know that the government isn't trying to develop a green hydrogen project. The government is trying to leverage a profitable just energy transition for the whole Namibian economy, okay? Because it's, it's going to happen. You can ask our colleagues from the EU. We just came from seeing them in Brussels. There's a huge commitment from a, a large part of the world to, to transition away from economies that rely on hydrocarbons. Um, and to do that, there are all manner of opportunities for countries like ours and others um, to tap into economic opportunities, to crowd in funding that we don't have, FDI grants, concessionary climate financing, ETC. And that's the opportunity that the government is ultimately trying to unlock and explore. Um, how did we end up with um, Tobias and Marco and Hyphen? The government ran um, a fairly open and transparent process to try and pick the best in class um, consortium that could actually build a first-in-kind in the world, probably, um, synthetic fuels asset in, in Southern Africa. And, and these, you know, Hyphen is a consortium between Nicholas Holdings and Enetrug came out on top, but we had all manner of um, other companies that applied to us, including CWP, um, who Margaret actually works with as well, um, and many other companies. So, so roughly, this is how we've ended up here. We've ended up here not because the Namibian government um, is a scientific boffin, but because the Namibian government is trying to stoke economic recovery by introducing new sources of stimulus that don't have to rely on a shattered budget, which we will talk about tomorrow. 
And so with that, I would really love to hand over, obviously, to, to the rest of the speakers. I have been told to try and introduce them a little bit. One of the caveat I got from them is I'm not allowed to say they're experts. So I'm going to say that they're compatriots, patriots, um, and brothers and sisters in arms. We've got Margaret Mushler, who will speak uh, on behalf of the Namibian Green Hydrogen Association. I think she's a chair there. Um, and then we've got Tobias Bishop Nims. Um, he heads up Enetrag in South Africa. Um, and he actually found the energy um, sort of department in the CSIR in South Africa. So he's one of you guys. And then we've got Marco, who's the CEO of Hyphen. Um, and he's more like me. He's a finance guy, um, CFA, CA. Um, and he might answer any strategic questions you have from a financing, a structuring perspective. Um, so hopefully that's a decent enough introduction. And of course, I'll be here to answer any questions. Um, but first, I'll, I'd invite Margaret up to give a little bit of context as to why the, um, Namgia is relevant. And then, of course, we'll hand over to the real not so experts experts to talk to you about the plans that we're trying to develop together. So, Margaret, over to you. Thanks. The experts are conferring. Just, uh, <laughs> uh, we just, uh, we're glad to, to oblige James. Um, well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we, I really appreciate opportunities like this to talk to Namibians because it's so important for Namibia um, and, and average Namibians to get informed, um, to ask the questions, to have debate, um, and in the end, get on with it. Um, so I would like to say um, part of the fact that we're actually standing here today um, so far advanced is because we managed to get to the point where we could roll up the sleeves and do it. And this is what we try to achieve. Yes, there are so many hurdles we need to cross. There are so many bridges we need to cross. There are so many um, aspects that needs to be addressed. There are so many risks that we, are know, that we know about that should be packaged. And some of them which we don't know, which we're going to package as we go along the, along the route. But the most important component and, the, and, and, and being here is testimony of people getting up and say, let's do it, let's get on with it. And there's one I've, um, I, I really praise government officials, um, but if there's one person that has proven that one person can actually make a hell of a difference in a movie, then James Newpe is part of that. Um, in, We, we started with the development of this project. We, I'm talking about CWP H1 Energy, which is part of the hats that I'm wearing, started with project development in this scale um, around 2019. The first time we met with James was his first day in office last, the spring, last year, spring day, 1st of September. 1st of September, James was the first time that he really heard the words green hydrogen, I assume. And what has been achieved from then to now is testimony to constant drive and hard work. Very much congratulations, James. Okay, um, just maybe a little bit of background. I'm wearing tonight, I'm wearing a, a different hats. I'm wearing the hat of Namibia Green Hydrogen Association Chair. I'm the inaugural chair. Um, nothing fancy about it. It's the person that's around to do the work. Um, then I'm also a director of Tumanene Hydrogen Energy, uh, which is representing the developer CWPH1 Energy, um, working on the project in Namibia. And we have the um, proud but sad uh, banner of being the runner up to Hyphen Energy in the bit that was the first bit that was launched. Um, and we, but we're also fortunate uh, to do projects elsewhere and outside of Namibia. Obviously, coming back to Namibia, driving from Omururu yesterday, I was thinking there is no other place. There is no better place than Namibia to do projects. So I'm mightily jealous about you guys. Yeah? Um, and then um, I'm also a partner to a small boutique consulting firm called Mutter Consulting Services. 
Before I'm going to tell you what about what is Namgia um, and how you can become a member of Namgia, if you so choose us as an organization, allow me just quickly to dip into my experience as a developer in Namibia um, and share some insights with you. I'm not going to bore you. You are going to get a slide. So I'm not going to read verbatim from the slides. I'm just going to have an opt script out of the heap discussion with you uh, before I tell you a little bit about Namgia. I will try to stick to the time in doing so. Can you do the next slide, please? Okay. So why 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 are, why are people coming to Namibia? Um, wh why is CWP coming to Namibia, and why did Hyphen come to Namibia, for that matter? Um, and looking beyond our re renewable resources, looking beyond the fact that we have excess renewable resources, that we will never be able to consume in Namibia the amount of resources that we have, um, and therefore gives us an excellent opportunity to export these resources. But they also come to Namibia because we politically stable. We've We've got a, work, a working, well-defined regulator and legislative regime. We've got a robust monetary system. We have good infrastructure. I promise you, if you go outside Namibia, you come back Namibia, you realize what good infrastructure is. You will stop complaining about the small potholes in Namibia in Ventuk. And we have a skilled work resource. Um, Namibians are, partake, are participating not only in Namibia, but outside of the Namibia in developing projects. So we really have a lot to offer as Namibians, even though we are a pretty small company, uh, country. Can you go next, please? I'm trying to get you. Okay. So, so what is this about? And I'm sorry, I'm going to just go over there. Is it okay with the camera if I move? Yes. yes. Okay. So what is this? I feel like a preacher when I stand behind the culprit. What is this about? Um, it's about connecting the dots. Um, this project, my, my, you, you see the best side of me. Yeah? Um, this, this is about connecting the dots. And there are a number of dots that we can connect in doing projects of this scale and of this nature, and specifically a project where we talk about green hydrogen-based development. Um, James mentioned the economy, um, diversification of the export basket. Um, bringing another cake to the table. Um, we have socioeconomic environmental opportunities. Yes, there are risks that we will need to mitigate. Yes, we will need to be very careful because we work in a very sensitive area. And yes, I would like to take my grandchildren one day, as, one day they, uh, in those parks as well. Um, I've got to skip energy security now. I want to come back to this. We, we really have an opportunity to really sort out some of the water security issues we have in key areas where they, we have serious water shortages um, and to address food security, not only food for human consumption, but also for animal consumption. So there are so many opportunities that coming back to the energy security. These projects are massive um, in, in, in scale. And there's a reason why, why, why some of them are smaller and some of them are bigger. I'm talking about a bigger project. These projects are big in comparison to Namibia. Namibia's installed maximum, de uh, Namibia's installed demand or its installed capacity is just about 600 megawatt. We all know this. Our maximum amount around just below 700, 640 megawatt. We talk about a three gigawatt or a five gigawatt or a 10 gigawatt project. They, they are big. Just the excess energy after they optimize the, the, the uh, project, just the excess energy, which they might not consume, is about one and a half terawatt hours, which about 25% of our energy consumption in a, in a year currently. So you really get the opportunity to have access to energy, not only in electron format, but also in molecule format, which you can deploy and utilize in Namibia in new development or in value add, um, sorting out a grid putting it into battery storage, um, utilize it for other energy intensive uh, industry, bringing down the price of electricity um, so that you can actually get other industry going. Green, uh, providing an opportunity to prove the provenance for green development, green industry development, not only uh, run of the mill industry development. That is the upside of it. The downside of this, if we, if we don't, for instance, get to a point where we have green gold or green zinc, at some stage internationally, we're gonna see carbon taxes against gray gold or black gold. You're gonna see carbon taxes against gray zinc or black zinc for that matter. 
Okay, and, and at this stage, that zinc product, that gold product is utilizing electricity that is not totally green, and it's utilizing engines or a heavy machinery which run on fossil fuels. So the downside of this is what's going to happen with our industry if we do not have an opportunity to green it up, to clean it up. Um, so it's about connecting the dots. Can we move to the next one? So we have a lot of interest in Namibia, and I tell you, there's a lot of interest in Namibia. James, you got nine bits yeah, in the first round. Terrible. I hate you. Yeah, I got nine bits in the first round. Yeah. Um, so how do we maintain this interest? And I think this is where, 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 where the discussion amongst Namibians re to be, really need to be on a very detailed level. It's all about land. How do we have access to this land in a sustainable manner? How do we make sure that we have and we take investment friendly decisions? But investment friendly decisions for everybody, not just for the foreign investors, even for the Namibian, for the small SME in Namibia. How do we make it easier for our SMEs? How do we get our SMEs ready to participate in this? How do we, how are we flexible to accommodate these projects? Um, what do we need to do? How do we need to look at differently at life? Because I can tell you one thing is five years from now, life in Namibia will look different. So how do we adapt? How do we, how do we accommodate this? How do we make sure that we can actually bear the chances that, come, that comes with this? We need to send out a clear message and the government up until now have sent out a fairly clear message. Whether we like it or not, it was, it was very well received. We need to look, Namibia, the, the big, the big um, interest for industry in Namibia is because we can export. Um, we don't have the economies of scale to do develop this just for Namibia. Is we, we, can, we can actually export another product. If we export another product, we need to be competitive internationally. So how do we remain competitive? We ride down in the, in the south part of Africa. We're not located close to North Africa. We're not that close to our markets. Where else do we find the markets and how do we remain competitive in that? I'm working on a PV project now, 25 megawatts. The workforce on that project is all Namibians, 400 people at a peak time. Not now, at a peak time, 400 people. Now, can you imagine the workforce you need if you want to do two gigawatt or three gigawatt? You're not going to do it all in once. You definitely can do it first. But even if you do 500 megawatt in a year, or half a gigawatt, whatever it is. Can you imagine the workforce that you need? You will need to take that and multiply it. And the thing is, we have the building blocks. In Namibia, we have the skills, we have the workforce. We just need so much more of it in Namibia. And we better get so much more of this. Otherwise, we're gonna see migration of people coming to Namibia. Business fraternity. There is so many opportunities for business fraternity to get involved. Whether you are a cleaner, a supplier of equipment, a logistics company, um, a, tourist, a tourist company, whatever your business is, whether you're a scientific company, whether you are a, a, a supplier of uh, screws and nuts or but water water pump tanga, you know, small tools, whatever it is, there are so many opportunities. You will just need to go and think about and repurpose and say, how can I become part of this? And what should I do to my business to actually benefit and become part of this? And there is a good business fraternity in Namibia. We should just build on it. What is fact uh, foreign investors take in consideration? And I'm sure Hartman's going to talk about this. It's all about risk mitigation. It's a, it, and, and what is the legal system in place? Does it function? What is the regulatory system in place? And is, is the, are there some gaps? Now, talking about regulatory framework, we sometimes, we look at electricity industry. I'm coming from the electricity industry. In electricity industry, when we talk about regulatory framework, most of us think about the generation license that we need to get. Regulation in Namibia goes beyond that. Regulation in Namibia. If you do anything financial, you get a financial regulator. Yeah, it's either the Bank of Namibia or NAMFISA, or sometimes even the government of Namibia. You have a water regulator. We don't. We might not think like it, but yes, when you try to do a drill, a, a drill, a, a borehole, you have certain regulatory uh, functions that you need to apply to. We have electricity regulator. We have an investment regulator. We have. And, and I can continue like this. 
uh, if you when you construct a building, when you when you hand in plans, uh, all of these are regulated. So it's not that the regulation is not there. The question that we need to ask is when this regulation was crafted, it did not necessarily consider that Namibia will these, do these type of, of projects one day. So if we look at the electricity regulation, we have off-grid regulation, but it's very light. Okay. The question we have is what do we want to regulate? What do we need to regulate? Why do we regulate? And what of this already gets regulated through international standards and practices? And how can we clever hatch onto this? Because we do not want to compete with this and we don't want to be in conflict with this either. Um, so we need to talk about the regulatory regime for sure we need to do that. Um, monetary policy systems and structures is important. Um, and then your fiscal policy. So let's go, what is Namgia? Next slide. Okay, so Namgia provides a private sector, a platform for private sector to engage with each other and to engage with the government of Namibia. A private sector is anybody that does not own, is not public sector, yeah? Um, it guides the sustainable development of the industry and associate legislation and regulatory framework and promote local job creation and associated regional economic development. These are our three aims. Our mandate is to present, maximize, have a common voice and advocate. Obviously the mission is to look at low, low carbon economy, diversify the export basket, um, support economic development, enhance support uh, the economic development and job creation. And all our objectives start with either promote support, guide and influence. Go to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so as James has said last year, this time, you're absolutely correct. It's what this, what today's date is the? February, we're still in February. Uh, <laughs> you, you're getting seasick or what? <laughs> uh, yeah. So last year, February, Namgya didn't exist. We were talking about, we were talking about it. March, 2021, the inaugural meeting took place. We presented the draft constitution um, and said, okay, this is how we think we're going to do this. We had at that inaugural meeting was a combination of a, a virtual meeting and a, and a physical meeting. And in the end, we had about 262 participants um, interested in, in doing this, which I thought was pretty okay uh, for a first inaugural meeting. Um, from there, we created, uh, in that same, that same day, we had our first EXCO meeting, um, EXCO member selected EXCO meeting. And as I said, by, uh, by sheer fact that uh, I was around to do the work, um, I was selected in overall chairperson. Um, from there, we worked quite a lot in trying to get the constitution right, the legal framework right, have a debate about this. Um, how do we set up uh, bank accounts, auditors, um, uh, drafting the type of person, getting the name reserved, um, and so all of this took us up until end of last year, and we at least, at, at finally has had a very breakthrough um, EXCO meeting where most of these have been approved and we could finalize this. And I think I got a last signature on the constitution about a week ago from Bernd Walbaum. Achter um, oskom ook in die um, and now we can physically open a bank account. We, we, will, we, can, we have sent out membership forms. Um, you welcome this an address where you can apply for membership. We are not yet open for individual people. We are open for companies, organizations, etc. What are our objectives? Um, you can read it, you can, you can get a fine print, you can read it, or you can get a copy of the constitution. I'm not going to read this verbatim. But it's basically addressing policy legislation and regulation in the private as well as in the public sector in order to um, support, enhance um, the rollout and the deployment of green hydrogen based um, economy. Um, to look at a specific project development um, around, around the strategy for Namibia, how do we want to take this forward and have, have debate and discussion with the government around the enabling framework for projects to, that need to be put in place. Um, 
sorry, I can't read my certification, very important. When we talk about green hydrogen, interesting enough, the government says green hydrogen. So when we talk about green hydrogen, how green is green? So we really need to make sure that we have international standards, best practices and, and certification in place in order to prove the provenance of our project for our users, whether they're local or international, um, for various reasons. Um, We'd like to make sure that through this process, we enhance the ability of Namibians and international, uh, international investors to participate in a digital econ economy um, based on the back of the uh, green hydrogen development um, and look for um, ways and promote ways how to find funding, of, of funding opportunities, not only for the big investors. In fact, the fund, the, they are pretty good in finding their own funding opportunities, but starting looking at SMEs, the Namibian. So, so how do we bridge this gap between, um, as, a, as a, a business now, whether it's an SME or not an SME, and actually have to step up to that plate and actually step up that work um, and, and, and output um, to become and, uh, and participate in, in this economy? Uh, we, because we, we're looking at market and export channels, this is not only for Namibia, it's also export, but also look at opportunities to promote the deployment, the local deployment of hydrogen-based use cases, uh, products, uh, uh, channels, um, distribution outlets, etc. Um, disseminate information, support research, um, create debate um, around uh, the whole aspect of green hydrogen-based economy, um, provide a common voice to answer concerns about hydrogen energy. And yes, you need to raise your concerns and let's answer this. Let's try and answer this. If we don't have an answer, let's go and find it together. Let's go and seek them. Um, share non-commercial um, information that's not sensitive. Um, and yes, and promote research and uh, research and development. In making all of this happen, whether it is a deployment into Namibia, like uh, ONL, clean energy, CMB and ONL is doing, whether it is an export to South Africa, whether it's export to some port in, in, uh, in Europe, um, we, we need a lot of research to make sure that we can make it work from here. Okay. You have different membership classes and they come with different prices. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we have the EXCO membership. It's the uh, EXCO is just a subset of the normal industry associated uh, consulting and financial institutions. And can I sum this up? The only exclusion that we have is individual persons. So if you related to hydrogen or associated to hydrogen or think you're going to be associated or have an industry or have a company and you think you'd like to become a member, if you're SME, we give you a discount. If not, um, they are the, there's the price tag for this year. It's cheap. And how do you become a member? You email me and I'll send you a membership form. Uh, we process the membership form, we put you on a, on a database, and the moment we have a bank account that's working, we send you an invoice. That is as easy as that. And I think that was me. So thank you so much, Margaret. And I'm not going to poach in your garden, but I will challenge the membership invitation. And so we are nobody's competition, but everyone's colleague, and we are also a membership association. So I'll later come back to take the companies on your word and invite them, or let me rather say bluntly what I actually honestly think, I'll challenge them to become corporate members and individual members of Namibia Scientific Society. But we leave that for when we have a drink. For now, I want James to please introduce the next speaker. Great, I'll, I'll say what I said last time. This is Tobias. <laughs> He heads up NHRG in South Africa, and he's a scientist like all of yours. Um, yeah, and he's super keen to try and delve into what it is that they're trying to do in, um, in Namibia. So, Tobias, over to you. Thank you very much. I will, I will do the same as 
Margaret told us already how to present because I'm I'm the son of a pastor, but uh, that's probably even more reason why I don't want to stand here and and uh, have the feeling that I heard. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's a great great uh, pleasure, privilege, honor to be here tonight and to uh, to present to you what what Hive and what the project is doing, but also to present to you our view on the the hydrogen market, the global hydrogen market, its implications for Namibia, the opportunity it presents itself, and uh, what the implications are from our from our perspective for Namibia, for the Namibian economy, for the whole industry um, that that can be built around around hydrogen. Um, uh, if you want to start with the first slide, yeah, just a just very, uh, very quick agenda overview, the hydrogen op opportunity uh, from a global perspective and zooming in into what, what that means for, for Namibia, talking also a little bit about the, the energy system and, and how the energy system globally will be re restructured with uh, solar and wind becoming the new primary energy sources. Then we delve in into the hyphen project itself and share a little bit the, the details of where we currently stand in terms of technical design of the project. And then uh, last chapter on the impact for Namibia as, as we see it. Now let's start with the hydrogen opportunity. Um, so first of all, um, yeah, may, maybe, maybe wait with the, with the first one, if you don't mind. I, I will let you click. So it's great, great, to, great to have my click man right, right with me if, if that's it. Is that is that a hit, man? That's a different <laughs> different thing, right? <laughs> um, so future energy system. Uh, let's take a step back. Let's take a step back from from Namibia. Let's look at the global energy system. And I think decarbonization. That's that's clear. It, it, uh, all all major countries, economies, regions have have indicated that they are moving away from hydrocarbons. The only question is really by when. So there are different target dates, but it's not really a discussion anymore whether we will get to net zero. It's just a question of by when. Will we will we go to net zero, and what that implies now? If we if we say well in the long run, we we are t uh, we are targeting net zero, net net zero from a carbon perspective. Yeah? That implies that we will not be able to use fossil fuels anymore. Otherwise, we we need we need so many artificial carbon sinks to balance the fossil fuels that doesn't make sense. It would be like like uh, mopping up while uh, and then not not uh, switching off the, the the water tap where the where the spillage is coming out. So in net zero, we will have a new primary energy source and the new primary energy source will be exclusively carbon free. And in the carbon free sources, of course, there are many, there are many more than the ones that we are indicating here. We are indicating solar, wind and hydro. Of course, there's biomass, there's geothermal, there, um, there are other, other renewable energy sources that are free of carbon. But why we focus on solar and wind? Well, for two reasons. The one is solar and wind harvesting in principle has no technical limitation, not, not from a perspective of like, like our global energy demand is much smaller than what, uh, what nature gives us in form of uh, sun and wind resource. And it's deployable literally everywhere. Yeah? Much better to deploy in Namibia for reasons that we will get into, but in principle, there's no limitation. You can build a wind turbine basically everywhere and you can put a solar panel everywhere no technical limitation that's very different to geothermal biomass hydro yeah there are always some some restrictions uh, topography or other restrictions um and the second reason why solar and wind will be the bulk new primary energy source is cost yeah? solar and wind are both mass manufactured products well not not the sun and the wind obviously but the the technology that we use to to convert sun and wind into electricity solar panels wind turbines Highly mass manufactured started 20 some 30 years ago, um, and and the cost came down very significantly in the last decade alone. Wind technology cost reduced by 40 to 50 percent. Solar cost uh, plummeted by 80 percent. So both solar and wind are now the cheapest new build options that we have in an energy system uh, compared to any other alternative. So so without ignoring carbon for a moment, purely from an economic perspective. These are the two reasons why those will be the bulk uh, um, uh, primary energy source. And now what that means now as an implication, um, solar, solar and wind, great, no technical limitation, the cheapest, but comes with a small caveat, it's variable. Now, obviously, the production is only when the wind blows and when the sun shines. Um, what that implies is that, that we need something to deal with the variability. We need to absorb the variability. Um, we, we cannot push all the electricity right into the electricity sector, but we need to kind of beneficiate it. So the, the raw electricity coming from sun and wind, you can see that as a, as a raw primary energy source, 
And now that primary energy source needs to be treated, just like coal that we take out of the ground. We need to treat it. You need to dry it, and then before you can burn it in a in a in a um, uh, in a coal-fired power station to produce electricity. Very similar, this primary energy source in itself it does, doesn't fulfill its purpose yet, but. Uh, we, we now have two in principle routes of what we can do with that. We either use it as electricity directly um, or we, we feed it through electrolysis process, splitting water with the help of the primary energy source. And then we have an energy carrier, hydrogen, that, uh, that we can then use for supplying end use sectors. Now, if we move into the next one, um, what are the different energy carriers really that we make out of this primary energy source? Well, it's either the direct electricity use, we will get to that where, where we're gonna uh, use it, and they are ranked in order of the individual pass efficiency, or we recycle the electricity um, in batteries. So we are still in the electricity sector, we still need electricity as the, as the uh, energy carrier, or we go one step further and we take the hydrogen and use it as straight hydrogen as an, as an energy carrier or we go further and combine hydrogen with nitrogen to make ammonia, um, or we go into the hydrocarbons world if we have a sustainable carbon source that is not of fossil origin, biomass or direct air capture from the air, um, then we can take the hydrogen and make either green methanol or green kerosene aviation fuel uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an energy carrier. Now this, this rank of energy carriers has applications now. Um, go on the, on the next one. Um, if we now look at the different end use sectors where we will use them, um, um, the, the, the direct electricity use we have predominantly in heating slash cooling. Uh, so anything that's related with, with space heating, space cooling. We have it in transport, battery electric vehicles. Um, that's where the battery comes in. Um, and, uh, and of course, we have all the normal electricity use that we, that we have today, lights, motors, pumps, yeah? everything that, is, that needs electricity right away. But then we move into the space of the, of the sectors that, uh, that, that, that we, cannot, we cannot run on, on straight electricity purely. Yeah? Just to show one, there's in the middle industry steel production. Um, it, in order to green steel, um, we have to. We, we will have to keep on reducing the ore, whether it's iron ore or zinc ore, as we've uh, as we've heard. We need to reduce it. Um, uh, reducing means we need to take the oxygen out of the out of the ore. And in order to take the oxygen out, we need something else that is more reactive with the oxygen than the iron. Today, that is coking coal. And of course, what happens if you take coking coal and iron ore? You get raw iron. Great, that's what we want. And the carbon from the coal and the oxygen combined to carbon dioxide. And that's why steel plants are some of the largest carbon emitters uh, in the world. But this, the exact same function you can get with hydrogen as well. Hydrogen is also more reactive with oxygen than the iron. So you can reduce the iron ore to raw iron and water. And the water vapor obviously coming out of the steel plant doesn't have any uh, environmental implications. It's just one example where for the steel production, we, we, uh, we, we need the hydrogen as, for its chemical properties. So it's not just about um, the, the, the energy carrier, but for the chemical properties as well. Then, of course, transport, especially long haul trucks, uh, fuel cell based trucks. But then we move into the shipping side. If you, if you think of the, the, the big container ships, um, we cannot run the big container ships on batteries. Um, it's very difficult to run big container ships on straight hydrogen as well, because hydrogen is a, is a great energy carrier, but it's very difficult to store. Well, it's not, it's not difficult, but it, uh, um, if, if you want large volumes, you have to liquefy it. Liquefy hydrogen is to go at very low temperatures, uh, close, to, close to zero Kelvin. So it's very, very uh, cold, not easy. And you have a lot of boil off. Um, uh, that's why it's not, I personally don't think we will have hydrogen, straight hydrogen shipping. What's much easier if you take ammonia. Ammonia is much easier to liquefy. At minus 30 something, 35 degrees, it's already liquid. Um, you can put that into the tank of a, of, a, uh, of a big container ship. And the container ship's engine, the combustion engine, can run on ammonia. You need modifications, of course, an engineering task, but there's it's nothing, nothing fundamentally in the way why we cannot run a big container ship on ammonia. Um, so that's the, the route to, to decarbonize the container ship uh, um, uh, route through green ammonia or, or green methanol as an alternative. And then the, the last space the, 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 uh, where, where we really, where we will need the hydrocarbons for their, for their chemical properties, energy density, both volumetric, but also mass energy density is for flying. 
and flying specifically the long haul aviation. Uh, short haul, medium haul can probably do with straight hydrogen, hydrogen electric flying, 2000 kilometers range maybe, but the long haul, the 12,000 kilometers, 14,000 kilometers, um, extremely, I mean, as an engineer, you never say it's impossible. Of, of course, it's theoretically, it's possible to fly one hydrogen, even 14,000 kilometers. But if you think through the implications, the entire design of the airplane has to change because you need much more volume to store the same amount of energy with, with hydrogen. So I think we will see for a very, very long time flying with kerosene in a net zero world that, net, that necessarily implies that the kerosene must be made from green hydrogen. Otherwise, we are not in a net zero world and we need a carbon source that is, that is sustainable, that is uh, carbon neutral, must be biomass, must be direct air capture. Um, and that's the, that's the space where we still need the hydrocarbons. Um, so so that, all of that implied, this is now basically, uh, this canvas implies to any energy system across the globe, it's the global energy system basically. Once the, all of this is converted, you cover more or less all the different sectors with this. We will need, depending on the study, of course, that you look at, but you will, we will need roughly 500 to 600 million tons of green hydrogen each and every year. Today, of course, we have hydrogen uh, sector already, um, uh, gray hydrogen made from natural gas mostly, um, that is roughly 80 to 90 million tons per year. So you can see we, we, we need to move away from the gray hydrogen and we need to make a much bigger hydrogen market than what exists today. Um, um, now, if we move on the, uh, on the next slide, um, these five to 600 million tons per year, now they, in, in principle, they can be produced, as I said, when I talked about wind and sun, technically they can be produced basically anywhere. Yeah, there's not a, it, it's, it's difficult to imagine locations in the world where it's technically impossible to run a wind turbine, solar plant, and to make green hydrogen. But of course, there are economic differences between different regions. The map that you see here, not our map, it's from the International Energy Agency. They, they analyzed uh, in very high spatial resolution the, the, the solar and the wind resource across the globe and converted it into a long-term achievable production cost of hydrogen. Um, that's, that's always uh, important to note. The, the cost, the production cost that you see here for the hydrogen is not what we're gonna be able to achieve today. We are in the ramp up phase of an industry that doesn't exist yet, but in the long run, those are the costs that we should be able to see. But what's more important than the absolute numbers is the relative between the different regions. So you clearly see world regions that have excellent wind and solar resources where the production cost of the green hydrogen because of this excellent resource will be lower than in other parts of the world. And um, if you now combine that with what, what Margaret also said is that uh, some, some regions have a combination of very strong resources while having relatively low own demand because of low population density or for other, uh, for, for other but it's, it's usually driven by, by population density. Um, uh, th those are naturally regions that are export orientated, yeah? where, where, the, the, where the green hydrogen and hydrogen derived products can be produced and can be exported. And then you have other areas that are naturally demand regions. Yeah? Europe, Japan is the most prominent example because there's no space there's, uh, and the space that exists is very hilly. So it's difficult to put uh, solar and wind uh, there. Um, but of course, because of the large industrial base, very large um, uh, uh, demand. Um, and Namibia, not surprisingly, is one of the, one of the prime locations, globally speaking, for, for very low cost uh, hydrogen production. Um, important to note, this map obviously is based on the assumption that all the input cost factors that, that we have for hydrogen production, that they are all exactly the same. The only difference is the natural resource, namely wind and solar resource. Yeah? Uh, just, just on a side note, of course, uh, what, are the, what are the other input cost factors? It's, it's the, 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 uh, the cost of the, in, of, the, of the capital that has to, so the cost of the wind turbines, the solar, the electrolyzer and so on. That is a fair assumption that this is a global commodity and that should cost the same everywhere, wherever you build. Um, the cost of the operation, that is also a global commodity, but then the cost of financing. Yeah? That is the, the, the third uh, cost input factor. And the assumption, the underlying assumption of this map is that the cost of financing is the same everywhere. Yeah? Um, now, you know, in reality, there are differences in cost of financing between different world regions. And, and, um, and the, 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 the resource advantage that regions have, like Namibia, um, can 
uh, I, I not say has to, but can be absorbed or eaten up by higher cost of financing um, uh, compared to, let's say, Middle East or, or uh, other regions. That's why, uh, in our opinion, apart from the technical development, the environmental development, uh, a very important additional aspect is the development of the hydrogen industry for Namibia on such a foundation that leads to the best financing conditions for hydrogen projects. Because if we don't achieve that, then, then we, might, we might lose this, this competitive advantage of having super good resources. Um, um, on the next slide, we will yeah, see a similar, uh, similar to, the, to the map that we saw, but just giving it a, a different, different structure in terms of natural import hubs and nat uh, natural export hubs. Uh, on the left, focus on, on, on Europe as an, as an import hub. So in the chart in the middle, you see two dimensions. One is the hydrogen demand that a certain region has for from a population density perspective, uh, multiplied with the industrial uh, base that exists. Um, and on the x-axis, you have the uh, supply potential for low-cost hydrogen. And supply potential means not just the, the ability to produce low-cost hydrogen, but also the, 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 um, the ability to produce large quantities of it. So it's a combination of sun, wind, and available land resources. Um, uh, obviously, it doesn't help if you have the best wind resource in the world, but you only have let's say if you're a Vatican city and you have the best wind resources, you will never become a super big uh, hydrogen exporter because you only have one square kilometer uh, at, your, at your disposal. Um, so in this, in this logic, if we now look at a number of countries slash regions, you see Japan, not, not surprising, pretty high demand for an individual country, a very high demand, very low potential for uh, low cost hydrogen production. So a natural importer of, uh, of energy in form of hydrogen. Then the EU, Similar, also, uh, of course, higher demand than Japan. So it's a whole block and not just a, a country, but also more own production potential. So that's why it's a bit further to the right. Um, China is somewhere in the middle. There's some, some very good potential to produce hydrogen themselves, but also very high demand, obviously. And then the US is an interesting one. The US basically has both. The US has resources that are not as good as Namibian resources, but close to it. Um, um, at the same time, the US has very high demand. Um, but, but we, we believe the US will probably be not a major player in a global hydrogen trading because they can basically produce their own demand themselves. So the US will be more of a domestic play in the green hydrogen space. And then on the far, uh, on the lower right, you have the natural export hubs. Um, not so bright, the typical suspects, Chile, uh, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, but then of course in, in Australia, and then of course in Southern Africa, Namibia, South Africa. Yeah? So South Africa with, much, much larger population number, of course. That's why the demand is higher. Namibia, low population, 2.5 million. That's why the demand is low, but the potential is super high on the Namibian side. <clears throat> and that's why this, this, whole, uh, uh, this, this whole global trade dynamic that will evolve um, uh, puts Namibia into a, a very comfortable position from being a, a, a key exporter of the, of the product into other uh, parts of the world that need to decarbonize and that they're willing uh, to pay a premium for green products. Um, um, now, how would that, if we zoom in on the right-hand side on the map, how would that work? What would be the natural export hubs? Well, we see basically we, three, we see three different directions of how the exported product could, could leave Namibia. Uh, not, not talking about the supply of green hydrogen and electricity into the Namibian uh, energy sector itself uh, that that uh, not only exists but is a, it's a great opportunity but that's not the, the the focus of this particular slide but the three areas for export we see is either straight out of namibia that's the core at the core of the project that we are developing at the moment in form of green ammonia um, export facilities straight into uh, a global markets that require uh, ammonia um, the second opportunity is um, to, uh, to export further derived products. That's more a medium term game like uh, green steel um, or um, there's, there's nothing in the way of having uh, iron ore reduced in Namibia where the resources are and then have the raw iron which is much more valuable than the iron ore have the raw iron, the reduced iron have that exported to steel mills elsewhere that are then producing the end product and supply it into car manufacturing or whatever. And the third avenue is a regional play 
the export uh, exporting of uh, green hydrogen in straight form into South Africa. Because South Africa with its industrial base has again the opportunity to go into the green steel space and also to go into aviation fuel um, in form of Sasol. Uh, Sasol Secunda is, uh, is producing aviation fuel synthetically today already on the basis of coal. If that gradually, if that coal is replaced with green hydrogen and a sustainable carbon source, there's a huge uh, thing for green, uh, a huge demand for green hydrogen uh, in the region. And of course, uh, hydrogen to, to transport hydrogen via a pipeline uh, is technically absolutely feasible and it's also a relatively low cost per, per energy unit. Um, so that's the overall picture that we see for, for Namibia on the green hydrogen side. On the next slide, we can now move. Maybe I pause for a moment and see if there are any any questions on, on this one, or should I go straight into the hyphen project and then do questions after that? I see some some nodding, so let's move into the hyphen project summary first. Yeah. Um, so just very very quickly, structure of hyphen hyphen is is a is an is an uh, a registered Namibian uh, legal entity. Um, uh, jointly owned by uh, Niklas Holdings, an uh, infrastructure investor um, uh, with, with a lot of exposure in, in, in Southern Africa, especially uh, most prominent investment in traction, uh, a train operator in, in Southern Africa, uh, active in Namibia as well. Um, and, uh, and of Enatruck, that's what, who I'm representing. We are a German company, um, uh, one of the pioneers of the German energy transition and are now active in 10 countries across the globe, um, uh, two of which are South Africa and, and Namibia. And we, and we jointly uh, a bit in the RFP last year, as we've heard uh, with, with Hyphen and were uh, um, uh, successful in that, in that RFP and are now uh, implementing and developing the Hyphen project. Um, on the next slide, we now move into we have, we have a very short, it's only two minutes uh, video, but in that video, I will do a voice overlay. So I will explain what you, what you see. And it, it's much faster the two minutes than if we have five slides explaining the same, the same thing. Um, so let's, let's get started with the, the video. Yeah. What, what you see now in this video is, is the actual project area yeah? um, uh, overlaid with something that doesn't exist, obviously, the wind turbines and the solar field, but just to give a, an impression of how this looks like. So the general layout and architecture is at the project site, we will have wind turbines in, of course, spatially distanced. We have the solar farms and then right in the center of this electricity uh, production area, we have in those warehouses, that's where we will have the electrolyzers. So that's the facilities that produce the hydrogen. Then so that's right in the center of a, of, a, of a circle of maybe 30, 40 kilometers where the uh, solar and wind electricity is produced. Now from those warehouses, we have these servitudes running to the port of Lideritz area into a chemical plant. And maybe, can you, can you make a standstill for a moment? Yeah. So, so these, the servitudes uh, um, that, that, that run to the port of, of, of Lideritz here is, is a threefold. Um, we have uh, two pipelines and then electrical grid infrastructure. The pipelines have two functions. The one pipeline is bringing desalinated seawater from Lüderitz to the project area. That, that desalinated seawater is then split in the electrolyzers with the help of the solar and wind electricity into hydrogen. And the hydrogen is going back in the second pipeline, which is a hydrogen pipeline, and bringing the hydrogen back into the Lüderitz area. And the third uh, um, uh, uh, common user infrastructure is, of course, the electricity grid. The, the, the purpose of that electricity grid is not to supply the electrolyzers with electricity. That is what's being done by the solar and the wind farms. But the purpose of that electricity grid is to supply surplus electricity into the Namibian slash Southern African power sector, exactly as, as Margaret indicated. The, the, the cost optimal design of such a system is always to overbuild wind and sun um, to build more than what the electrolyzers actually need in terms of electricity, that is optimal irrespective of what you do with that electricity, with the surplus electricity, because you want to achieve a high utilization of the electrolyzers and of the whole chemical infrastructure. And for that, you need to overbuild. Now that overbuild on the solar and wind side means that there is surplus electricity that can be provided into the electricity sector. And that surplus electricity very quickly gets into dimensions that are very substantial and can help to decarbonize the Namibian electricity sector, but going further into second, third, fourth project also help to decarbonize the whole region, uh, the Southern African power pool and not just the Namibian sector. Now these, these three, so, so we have a water pipeline, hydrogen pipeline, electricity, 
that goes into this chemical plant facility, an industrial complex in the Lüderitz uh, port area. Um, and this chemical facility has two purposes. The one is on the right hand side is desalination facility. So that's where the seawater is desalinated. And then on the, on the other side, you have the ammonia production facility. That's where the hydrogen is converted with the help of nitrogen into ammonia. Um, so why do we have this architecture? This architecture with the project side basically only supplying electricity and hydrogen and not the finished product. Well, there are two reasons. The one is that ammonia um, is, is, a, is, a, um, is a chemical product that you don't want to transport over large distances. Um, um, it's, uh, it's more difficult to transport um, and, uh, uh, and you don't want to have ammonia leakages in the pipeline either. So it's much better to have the ammonia very close to the export facilities um, and, and transport the hydrogen. Um, the second reason is that the hydrogen is basically the generic building block for any chemical products that you want to produce out of it. And um, ammonia is just our choice to start now for a number of reasons, mostly commercial reasons, and that there's an, there's an immediate uh, infrastructure available to absorb ammonia. But of course, you can produce methanol. Of course, you can produce green steel. You can produce green zinc. You can produce uh, aviation fuel. Yeah? And, there, uh, and, and therefore, because the hydrogen is so multi-purpose, it's, it's much better to, to supply the hydrogen in bulk into an industrial site rather than supplying the finished products. And then you have 10 different finished products arriving in, in Lidlitz. Um, yeah, and if we now go on the... Uh, yeah, and now, now from that, industri from that chemical uh, industrial site, we now have, again, three pipelines going into, um, into the sea. So the one pipeline is the ammonia pipeline liquefied ammonia cooled down to 35 degrees and then it's liquid and then it can be can be pumped. So that's the one on the left and the two pipelines on the right are the seawater pipelines. So the one takes the seawater in, desalinates it, and then uh, the other one uh, uh, pushes the brine uh, um, uh, back. Um, the, the ammonia is then um, through a, a multi-boy mooring system, um, supplying the ammonia into a, a typical ammonia cargo ships, ships that exist already and can then be uh, exported. So that's the general layout of, uh, of hyphen, of the hyphen project. Um, if we now go into the next slides, uh, yeah, just, just some, some, some key figures. Installed capacity, um, conservatively uh, estimated. Why conservative? What is the main what is the main limitation? The limitation are is the is are the uh, uh, environmental considerations. The um, the area that we are developing on uh, is able to host much more than five gigawatt of renewables. But we have been extremely conservative in our estimates, applying very very rigorous exclusion areas from an environmental perspective, and said, well, we will only build at the location where there is where there is uh, no or very limited environmental implication. And with that very rigorous approach, um, we get to roughly five gigawatt renewables and three gigawatt electrolyzer. The detailed environmental studies will determine what exactly can be built, but that's at the moment the, the planning assumption. Total investment close to 10 billion US dollar. Um, the green hydrogen production potential of that uh, setup is 300,000 tons per year. Um, and uh, during the construction of four to five years, uh, uh, there will, will be a job requirement of 15,000 uh, uh, jobs during construction. But, um, and, and that is a, is a large number already during construction, but the direct jobs during operation, and these are direct jobs purely within the project company uh, to operate the solar, the wind, the electrolyzer, and the ammonia facility is uh, roughly 3,000 permanent jobs uh, for this one, one project. To put these numbers into perspective, um, uh, if you click on the next one, please. Um, the the uh, close to 10 billion uh, US dollar investment volume. That's that's close to the annual GDP of of Namibia. So, of course, this is not this is not just a project. This is um, this is just just one project that can be rolled out into ma ma uh, 10, 10, 15, 20 times. So you see what the implication is for the Namibian economy. This is um, this is the, the the start of a. Um, uh, of a kind of redefinition of the Namibian uh, of the Namibian economy around an an, an, an export potential around uh, green hydrogen, uh, and uh, and to put the green hydrogen production into perspective, three hundred thousand tons. If you convert one 
large steel plant to, to decarbonize it, to move it away from coking coal into hydrogen, a uh, large steel plant requires 350,000 tons roughly. Um, so, so our project is the size that is required to decarbonize one big steel plant, which means it's sizable because steel plants are very big and they are big polluters in terms of CO2, but it's only one. Yeah, of course, globally, we have many, many more steel plants than just one, and we have many other sectors that need to be decarbonized. Um, just to what, what you saw in the video, to, now to put it on a map, you see again the, the three different um, uh, utility lines, the electricity line, the uh, water pipeline, and the hydrogen pipeline. Um, and um, what we want to, to show here again is the, is the general layout, which, uh, which is kind of the, the cost optimal architecture, is um, that, that the, wind, the wind and the solar is basically located around a central hydrogen production point. And then that hydrogen is then collected via hydrogen pipeline to the place where the hydrogen is then converted into the into the final product, be that ammonia or any other uh, um, any other product. Um, yes. So on the next next slide, see um, if we look at uh, uh, timelines. Um, a proposed timeline that we are that we are um, putting all our efforts behind to uh, to work towards that timeline. Of course, it's a very ambitious one. So no no uh, no mistake. It's not a it's not an it's it's not an easy it's not an easy task. Yeah. Um. Uh, um but uh, but it's 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 an ambitious timeline. But but still um, a timeline that is doable. Um. Uh, for uh, all pulling in the uh, in the same direction. And uh, with that timeline, we would have commercial first co commercial operation of the first phase. Um, towards the end of 26. Um, the, the nice thing of, about renewables in general and green hydrogen in, in specific is that you, that you can build uh, in, in phases, you can build modular. It's not, it's not like a big refinery that you have to build in one shot, but you basically, once the common user infrastructure is in place, the pipeline is in place, the, the servitudes are in place for the electric grid, the, the, hydro, uh, the, the, the water desalination is in place, then you can basically um, plug to that common user infrastructure, the projects, and, and ramp them up uh, gradually. The next slide. Yeah, the Im impact for Namibia, just the co-benefits that we see that are related to the hyphen project. On the energy side, we talked about that, the surplus electricity and, of course, hydrogen and ammonia for, um, uh, for Namibian demand. Um, on the water side, uh, the, the project, the desalination plant of the, of the project is overdimensioned by design now already to, to supply uh, uh, the volumes of desalinated water that the town of Lüderitz uh, uh, requires. It's a roughly 20 to 25% overdimensioning um, of the, of the uh, water that is required by the project itself. Uh, and of course, all the other infrastructures, roads, ports, rail uh, infrastructure, all co-benefits that come with the development of, of such, a, such a project. And now, um, uh, putting this into, into the context, how, how we look at it, what, what the Hyphen project basically is as a, as a first building block for the rollout of a, of a, um, a continuous role. It's like a generation a generational task, basically, the continuous rollout of hydrogen production facilities in Namibia. Um, if you if you look at the um, um, if you look at the the uh, Tsau Kaip, uh, National Park, uh, the, the the first two project sites that were allocated to Hyphen is this is this project area, and. Um, now, if you look at the at the entire uh, um, uh, project site and and how how you could uh, well the, the the entire available area let's let's say yeah, um, again very conservatively estimated with very strict environmental boundary conditions applied to it, you could probably build ten times what hyphen is in in the park yeah that means three million tons of green hydrogen production potential per year. So Hyphen is basically the first out of 10 po potential uh, projects or potentially even more. Um, that's why we, how, how we develop the project is very much from a perspective of laying the ground for subsequent rounds in, in, the, in terms of the common user infrastructure that is required. The hydrogen pipeline, the water pipeline, and the electric grid infrastructure. Um, so so that, that in, the, in the long run, in the end state, you would have a hydrogen pipeline going through the park, collecting the hydrogen from many different project sites that are basically plugging into the pipeline, producing the, hydro the hydrogen 
at the specific project location um, uh, and then and then plugging into the pipeline so that the hydrogen can then be collected towards Lüderitz or towards the south. And in the long run, you would then have the yellow lines like dispatchable power towards Namibia and South Africa coming out of this entire region that will have many, many dozens of gigawatts of installed uh, capacity. And then the, the green one, the green hydrogen pipeline, um, uh, th that's the regional play, the green hydrogen pipeline uh, could then be extended into South Africa, going through the Northern Cape all the way to the east towards Secunda. And that's kind of the, the long-term 2050 view of how, of how this uh, structure could look like. Yeah, on the next slide. Let's start now the, the, the summary. Yeah, so in summary, um, um, production potential beyond hyphen project, 3 million tons per year, roughly uh, in, in, the, uh, in the national park alone. The competitive advantage of Namibia is, uh, has a unique combination of solar, wind, and land. So it's within, within one of the top five locations uh, globally. Um, uh, the, uh, 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 what, what oil and gas meant to commerce and, and related economic growth for fossil producers in the 20th century. Uh, uh, we believe that, is, that that's, that's what green hydrogen means to Namibia in the 21st century. Um, and uh, uh, Namibia can achieve a triad of economy, ecology, and social coherence. Uh, economy, the exporting of green hydrogen, can transform the country into an industrial nation with value creation along the entire value chain. On the ecological side, it not only reduces Namibia's own carbon footprint, but Namibia basically becomes an, an uh, uh, Namibia becomes a supporter of a global decarbonization effort because Namibia can, can export decarbonized products into the rest of the world and therefore helping other countries who, don't, who are not endowed with the same resources to decarbonize themselves and who are willing to pay a premium for that as well because it's a, it's a win-win situation. It's, it be, can be more cost efficiently be done here than in other countries. And then of course, the third one, super important for Namibia, social coherence. If this new industry should create equitable, sustainable, socially balanced growth, quality, well-paid jobs, and a welfare state for future, for current and for future uh, generations. Um, so, so we believe that such, a, such an opportunity doesn't really present itself every year. It's like a once in a lifetime, once in a, a, a lifetime opportunity um, for, for Namibia, uh, for, for the region and, and for, the, for the globe uh, at large. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you very much and um, looking forward to your to your questions that you might have. Yes. And now I, I took way too long. Now I can't see you anymore. <laughs> So oh, thank you so, so much for this elaborate explanation. I'm sure there are some questions. We got another microphone. We are waiting um, for the spotlights to switch on. We are still on the old fashioned energy and it takes some time until the spotlights come on. We are not as fast as your, <laughs> your projects are. Question number one, where okay. do we here. start? Konrad Rödern, would you please say who you are? And then Ruth will just say, do we have the question on Zoom or do we have to repeat it here? Okay. So can I start? Yes, Michael. Michael. I've just got one question. What can Namibia do to keep the finance costs down to stay competitive? Yeah, that's it. It's an excellent question because uh, because the cost of financing is, apart from the resource, the most important cost driver. Um, so there, uh, there, there are on the, on the cost of financing, there are two aspects. The one is offtake. Yeah? Uh, that's there is not that much that Namibia can do, and it's also um, the same situation for everybody, for every supplier country across the globe. Offtake needs to be somehow secured. Someone has to make the first step and say. We are off taking on 10 years guaranteed volumes, guaranteed price. Otherwise, you cannot build infrastructure. Um, but that's, I would say, everybody is in the same, in the same game there. Now, Namibia specifically um, uh, is certainty around regulatory environment, certainty around um, the, 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 the legal regime, the tax regime. Yeah? Uh, so everything that drives the business case of investments like this. 
um, must be as certain as possible. And I'm not I'm not saying that as as hyphen as 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 us as the project company. I'm saying that on behalf of the finance community, that in the end will supply the bulk of that of the of the funding. You can imagine that I mean we we are. Uh, we are raising money for uh, substantially large scale projects but 10 billion is a ticket that is that is huge yeah and that's not that's huge for any individual company so the bulk of that 10 billion will be raised through debt financing from commercial banks and commercial banks will only give money into such infrastructure investments if they have when when they come in and they look at they turn around every single stone and they want to have absolute certainty uh, and visibility about the next 20 years of operation of that asset. So that's certainty is the most important thing. And that will bring the cost of financing down. Our, our objective basically is that we want to, we want to implement slash develop a project here that gets similar financing terms to other pro similar projects elsewhere in the world. If we achieve that, then we are left with that resource advantage and then everybody is happy. Oh, sorry thing is it's a team effort i think the other thing that we are doing um is engaging in what people are calling hydrogen diplomacy so for example last week you know we actually traveled to brussels we met the eu uh, and the eu for example has a program that they're trying to put together called the global gateway facility um and that is essentially they're trying to avail about 150 billion euros to emerging market countries but essentially africa to use some of that funding to begin to decarbonize these systems. It's also there for other things like infrastructure and IT, but that's an opportunity, for example, for Namibia to tap into um, uh, potentially very concessionary funding. And you might be able to use that to find some of the common user infrastructure that, that Tobias was talking about. Um, engaging you know, the BMBF, the BMBF will be here on Friday. They gave maybe a 40 million euros in grant funding. Some of that grant funding will be going into pilot plants which of course can be used to prove the Namibian resource, that Namibian infrastructure works, that provides the certainty that the developers want. Um, the, the funders then have um, a good reason to then provide you with capital um, at a lower cost of capital. So the answer isn't this project. The answer is a Namibian government working with private sector investors from around the world and other governments uh, and institutions and multilateral funding institutions from around the world to try and reduce the risk and to try and reduce the cost of decarbonizing not just Namibia, not just Southern Africa, um, but the planet um, uh, as well. Of course, what you guys say and do as well makes a big difference, right? If you're all very unhappy, uh, people wouldn't really want to build green hydrogen assets in a country where people are very unhappy. So it really is a team effort all the way from the developer to the government, uh, to the communities and, and to the continent as well. Yes, hello, uh, I am Johannes T. Namupala. I am a representative of the Namibian Youth on Renewable Energy, also known as Nam Nayore. I have two questions, uh, uh, one for government under James Nayupe and the, under, uh, and the other one for Nam Gia uh, for Margaret. Uh, the first question goes to James. Uh, is there a national standard or process before one starts their own green hydrogen project within Namibia? And the second one for Margaret, um, as Namgia uh, is a association in itself, are other NGOs allowed to become a member of Namgia? I think. Thanks a lot for your question. So we've actually started debating this in the Green Hydrogen Council, which of course is a subset of cabinet that has been put together by the president um, to help us start thinking about how we can um, incubate this particular industry in Namibia. Um, you know, and we came to the following conclusion, you can make green hydrogen or certainly hydrogen in class. Um, you literally take a solar panel, put two cathodes in a solution, put some potassium chloride, and you could start making hydrogen. And so, as government, or if you listen to Margaret, she was trying to say, do you want to regulate even that level of production of green hydrogen or only commercial scales uh, of green hydrogen? And then you have to start thinking about what is deemed to be commercial scale. 
So when we were, if, for example, interacting with um, developers like CMB and ONL, you know, the conclusion we sort of came to after we did some, you know, initial global research, anything less than 30 megawatts, we don't necessarily deem that to be a commercial scale. That could be deemed a pilot project. And then the regulations around that really would be the typical regulations you would need to get a generation license, some land, that sort of thing. And then, of course, there will be a few or not a few, but there would be some standards with regards to safety of dealing in, you know, with items such as hydrogen or ammonia, of course, they can be toxic, right? But once you do go larger than, than 30 megawatts, for example, we are then in the process of actually putting together some ena um, um, uh, enabling um, uh, legislation. We're actually working closely with Hyphen, but also with partners from around the world, whether it's Germany, Chile, the GSZ is helping us with that as well. So we are hoping to put forth um, some sort of enabling um, legislation, hopefully by the first half of 2022, we'd be you know, giving you uh, a, a really uh, good update in, in that regard. So I suppose watch this space, but as well, when we are going to put, you know, we're putting together a draft bill, we will obviously circulate it um, to the public for comments. And so obviously I'd really love to get your comments and, and from all of you from the scientific society as well. Thanks for the question. I think it's a relevant question. And on top of that, you need to start thinking about things like certification and standards, definitions, what is hydrogen, green hydrogen, ETC. So start doing your research. We will come to you for comments. Thanks. It's been a lecture, so my voice carries. Uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. And not only that, um, in our membership structure, the executive committee will consider the membership fees for associations on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, a big part of our success is how well we can network to spread the information and to get in and, and to get uh, debate and dialogue going. So absolutely you're more than welcome. Just something on this, I believe in a light regulation. So, so you're taking your example of classroom hydrogen. Yeah, There's actually a labor law in Namibia that has a hazardous substance uh, religious, uh, regulation in it. So it is not as if we need to reinvent the wheel. Hi, um, my name is Chumi um, from uh, NetBank Namibia. Um, I, my question is to uh, the hyphen team around the um, the feasibility of the project. Um, you said it will cost around 10 billion uh, US dollars and the production capacity would fund would be enough for you know one large steel plant. Is that likely to be um, financially or economically feasible or would one need to scale that up you know using the the common infrastructure you built at first and so on um, to become um, economically feasible. So, so the, the 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 project with the with the end state size of three hundred thousand tons per year that is in itself economically feasible from a from an economies of scale perspective. Um, uh, in fact, you can actually go substantially smaller than that and are already economically feasible. The 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 component that is a fixed cost item which which doesn't uh, um, with, which, which, has the, which brings in an economies of scale effect is the common user infrastructure. That's the pipeline, the two pipelines, and the uh, uh, electric uh, grid infrastructure. So that's where what, what James mentioned, potential concessional financing, government to government financing, if, uh, if we are able to get the common user infrastructure in place in such a way that subsequent projects can hook up to it, that's, that's much better than to build an infrastructure that only suits hyphen, which would be too small for subsequent uh, projects. Yeah. Maybe it's, oh, you already, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I've got uh, one question, let's take it. Oh yes, uh, who I am. Uh, my name is Ted Schnebel, I'm civil engineer and I'm Namibian. Uh, you mentioned the national park, uh, of which we Namibians are very proud. And uh, how many square kilometers would you need to produce three kilowatt, a gigawatt in about a month? And the next question, short question is, I always hear the word green hydrogen. Is it also something like pink or red or blue? Thank you. Okay, to Th thank you very much for for those questions. That's actually uh, yeah, it's, it's a it's a very interesting one. The the second one. So on the first one, the footprint. Um, 
the the total now I stand correct, but Marco is is watching what I what I'm saying. So you 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 help me with the numbers. Uh, the t the total the total uh, um, land area that that we are developing on at the moment is uh, roughly four thousand square kilometers. The total park has a size of twenty six twenty six thousand square kilometers. Yeah. Of that four thousand square kilometers, the actual like the the physically disturbed area based on the five gigawatt and three gigawatt assumption that we are planning towards at the moment is single digit percentages. Um, if you uh, if you take uh, so if you uh, if you look at disturbed area uh, in terms of uh, 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 roads, uh, the the turbine foundations, um, and then the footprint of the of the solar plants, then we are looking at I don't have the exact number handy, but it's two to three percent of the total of the assigned land that is actually disturbed uh, uh, disturbed area. Um, to your question in terms of the color coding, um, uh, of course, uh, chemically, it's all H2. Yeah? So there is no difference. It's a pure regulatory certification question, but it is it will be a very important one, as uh, James has alluded to. There, there will be um, uh, there will be off takers, countries, regions, individual companies who are willing to pay a premium if the hydrogen that they buy, which of course is always the same chemical, um, uh, if it is produced according to certain principles. And the, the principles according to which the hydrogen is produced determines how the color is, how it's color coded. Yeah? And, and therefore it is more than just um, just a fancy color coding scheme, it, it, it will in the end have actual and real monetary value. So um, if we uh, in, in, in Namibia, if we if we produce the hydrogen, we have to be absolutely sure and certain that we produce according to the specifications of, say, green hydrogen in the markets that are willing to pay a premium for it. Um, uh, pink actually exists. Pink hydrogen is hydrogen that is based on uh, nuclear power. Um, and what, what other colors did you say? Blue? Well, blue is, is a hydrogen uh, produced from natural gas, so conventional way, steam methane reforming, but combined with carbon capture and storing away of the CO2 underground, that the CO2 that would otherwise be emitted uh, during the hydrogen production. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting space, the color coding uh, on its own. It's a, it's a scientific topic, actually, on its, in its own right. Here we go. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yep. Um, I'm Andre Dipassani. I'm not a, an engineer nor a natural scientist, uh, but I, I am concerned about projects like these. Although James has emphasized that it's not just about the project per se, it is a much wider approach to make an energy transition that is sustainable and just. Uh, but Clearly, there are environmental concerns. That's absolutely clear. Uh, we know some of them. Some of them we don't know. We'll discover them. But I am not convinced at all around two issues. The one is that these kinds of approaches to development are going to build social cohesion in the country. Social cohesion is not dependent on these types of approaches to, to development. They are dependent on human development, on food security, on access to primary health care, uh, on the respect for the dignity of citizens. All the indicators that I've looked at, and I've looked at many, would, would tell us that the social cohesion in Namibia is busy fragmenting and collapsing. I am not even convinced that we'll have four years before the society might actually fall apart along lines which are very difficult to, to, to bring together, to integrate the society. The nation building project itself is in crisis for reasons that have got nothing to do with you or, your, or the project or green hydrogen or whatever. Those are the issues that we first and foremost need to address before we come with grand mega projects, legacy projects that are linked intimately to the personalities and the lifestyles of individual politicians. Forget about those. So that's the first concern. Social cohesion is something entirely different. And we don't have the raw material 
to use that terminology to build social cohesion. In fact, you can look at every indicator you want, whether it's a governance indicator, whether it's a social inclu inclusivity indicator, whether it's a, a poverty indicator, Namibia is actually declining in terms of its cohesiveness. So those are the issues that need to be addressed before we start thinking and tinkering for these major projects, important as they undoubtedly are. I don't question their importance. The other issue is the brain drain. Margaret spoke so brilliantly. I wish you could meet my students at the university. Speak so brilliantly about that we have all the human capacities and the skills, and certainly we have a lot of them. But the reality is that most of our advanced students migrate elsewhere. They leave the country. They don't stay in Namibia. And that has got nothing to do with race or class or ethnicity, but simply because their argument is that this is a society where hope has died. It's a society where hope has died for the youth. These projects are not about me. I'm 75. They're not about me or many of us. They are about the young people, the next generation coming after us, those yet unborn. But our young people, I've been working in higher education in many countries for more than 40 years. Our high advanced students in different disciplines don't come back and stay. They come back, they meet a bonding requirement, they leave. They migrate like elsewhere in the world to greener pastures. So those are issues that I think we need to be honest about and bold about. I'm not blaming you. I'm not saying you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't invest. You shouldn't do the things that are also important. But those social contexts, those human issues are not being considered. We are looking at numbers which are bewildering. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way I believe that we're going to build a cohesive society and a just society for that matter. Sorry, as the Namibian, let me take this. It's really extremely um, good point you make, Professor de Bassani, if I may call you Professor. Yes. Um, and I think that is part why developers start with the socioeconomic um, impact assessment first. And, and this is what we have done, certainly. That we do it perfectly? I don't think so. You're absolutely right. I think we really touch when we in the screening, we touch it. And I think we really need to listen to, to what you're saying and say, when we do those socioeconomic impact assessments, what are those specific criteria and markers that you are looking at that we should try and address through this process? And a project in itself can go a long way in addressing some of this. Just take your brilliant students. Suddenly, if you give them opportunities to actually participate in a project like this and you de-risk, I'm a big big person for local content because that's the way you de-risk projects is by doing local content so suddenly you give them opportunity to actually participate in something beyond just the normal um you know uh, tenderpreneurial uh, opportunities uh, so so i think it would be good to engage and see what are those aspects that we should still build into our socioeconomic um, um, uh, impact assessments as developers. I'm not talking on behalf of the government. James is big enough to do that, yeah? Um, in order to have a meaningful impact in doing and in, in addressing this. But thank you very much. And please feel free to send us along. And I would love to talk to your students. Yeah, good evening. My name is Nico Brückner from Namibia Engineering Corporation. I've got two questions. The one is, uh, we are talking about 9 billion US dollars. Uh, what is the return of investment uh, for the investors? Um, and what's happening and what will be the kickback? Not the kickback, that's the wrong word. The um, Sorry, take that off the record, please. Uh, what What is the benefit for Namibian in the long term? And a plant like this uh, obviously has got uh, a limited lifetime. And that return of investment is linked to a certain time frame of 20 years, 50 years, whatever. What happens if certain components are done and you need to physically replace and to change? What is what is the lifetime of, of such a plant in that in that magnitude? Thank you. 
So on the on the return on investment, I will say something um, that will probably surprise you. Um, we will have achieved a great project if the required return on investment is as low as possible. Um, that is directly linked to what we discussed earlier, the cost of financing, because the cost of financing is a blend of cost of debt financing and cost of equity financing. The lower the return requirement is for whoever the ultimate investor is together with us, institutional investor, pension funds, whatever. If we, if we manage to get global pension funds to invest their money in Namibia at low, but de decent but low infrastructure type of returns, then we have done an excellent job, not as developers, but as, a, as partners together with the Namibian government. So that's maybe, maybe not the answer that you expected, but that's exactly what we are working towards because if we don't achieve that, if we don't achieve to put a project like this into the asset class of infrastructure investment, then we are afraid then we will not have a project and we will definitely not have multiple projects in Namibia because the cost of financing will simply out, out compete um, the Namibian investments. In terms of the, the replacement cycle, Yes, you're absolutely right. The assets that are being put there, they have a limited lifetime, like any engineered product that you deploy anywhere. You know? um, and um, what that means from, an, um, uh, from, a, from a perspective of like, like let's, let's stick with the renewables for a moment, not, not talk about the chemical plant, but the solar and the wind facilities. Uh, roughly speaking, 25 years, 30 years, I mean, 30 years, depending on what wind turbine you deploy, you, you, can, you can work with that assumption. Solar panels, maybe even a bit longer than that. Yeah, but let's, let's assume 30 years for a moment. Um, so after 30 years, you will have to repower. Yeah? Um, and what that means is that we will, we will have a ramp up phase. Let's say if it takes 30 years to reach the, 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 the steady state deployment of solar and wind facilities in Namibia. Once we reach that stage, we will have a continuous ongoing construction ac activity that becomes a steady state construction activity. Because the first projects from year one are then the ones that are being repowered in year 31. So that means we'll, ha we'll have, if, if, that everything, if everything is, is steady and continuous, then you have two sources of economic activity, of, of, uh, of job creation, of value creation, that is in the operation of the assets, and that's in the continuous and permanent and in perpetuity construction activity that, is, that, that moves into a repowering logic after 30 years. And you had, you had one more question, if I remember, it was, so, okay, thanks. My name is Konrad Röden, I'm an expertise for regenerative energy and uh, electric mobility. You, thanks for the very good presentation, Dr. Tobias, but um, there was a very ambitious ramp up to 2026. How do you want to get the finance if you don't have contracts, offtake contracts for the ammonia? It's also new for me that for the time being, we're talking ammonia, we are not talking green hydrogen uh, as a export product. And uh, um, yeah, alternatively, you could sell electricity to off takers um, to, to, to uh, lower the risk, not only contracts for green hydrogen, but um, how are you going to achieve to get fixed contracts for your electricity and for your uh, green hydro, uh, for your green ammonia, otherwise you don't have a business case. Well, it's a, it's a very very good question. Offtake is the other uh, is the other um, let's say risk uh, uh, factor that um, that every project is confronted with, not just Namibian projects, but any project in that space across the globe. Um, I think what I what I can can say is that. Well, there, there are a number of different avenues of where the where the offtake uh, will evolve over the next couple of months and, and years on the ammonia side, the ammonia in the shipping industry, the first ships like big ships, container ships that run on ammonia are being constructed as we speak. So uh, big container ships running on ammonia in itself is a very large um, uh, demand for for ammonia. Um, but then there are government programs as, as well that are designed to kickstart the whole green hydrogen uh, industry globally. 
Yeah. Uh, one, one such program, it's called H2 Global. It's a, it's a contract for difference type of uh, program that would offer 10 year uh, contracts for secured offtake at a, at a secured price in order to stimulate the first type of investment so that you can then build uh, on that. But uh, I think the most important uh, thing is that um, no, no, nobody in the, in the green hydrogen space at this point in time knows exactly who the first off takers will be. There's lots of discussions, but there are no, no signed contracts yet. Anyway, that's part of the development space in the next two to three years. Um, if the speed of the development is anywhere close to what the development was in the last 12 months and 24 months, then I have no doubt that on the offtake side, this is probably the of all the risks that exist for 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 projects like these is probably, let's say, a lower risk sounds like like playing it down. It's definitely a, a big concern, but it's but it's probably one of the risks that is the the easier one to manage. Let me put it this way. I'm Sven Stender from Bush Telegraph. Um, I'm uh, working in tourism, and uh, I'm really surprised uh, that uh, we were now work, uh, waiting for uh, the Tsao Kap uh, National Park um, for 18 years, I think. Uh, the land use plan, the first one was from 2004. Um, and uh, to, to open it up uh, for sustainable tourism, and there was a zoning of uh, the, the plants and what what um, uh, to, to really uh, make sure uh, that there's no impact. Uh, so we finally got now some concessions. Um, uh, I was really surprised that within half a year, uh, there is a huge uh, project like uh, uh, this here uh, happening and green lighting and, and waving through the whole instances. Uh, this sounds now very negative. Uh, there's a very positive side to it. Uh, I heard uh, that it's only two to three percent of the 4,000 uh, square kilometers that is really affected. That is good. The other thing, uh, the other uh, very positive uh, um, uh, message uh, that I heard is that you are really sure that the future will be um, um, taxed, uh, that we will see taxes on, on carbon. Um, now that we see that uh, France defines uh, uranium or atom uh, energy as green and Germany plays along uh, with gas uh, because they have the gas and they also de declare it as green sort of thing. Uh, so that is a positive side uh, that uh, there's so much money put into it. I also feel very honored uh, that uh, with 10 billion US dollars um, that you take the effort of hearing us here. Uh, the Namibian uh, Scientific Society. I have two questions. Um, is this demand um, based on governments saying that uh, this tax uh, uh, system will be in place? Is that we are really reliable because that defines the demand in future? And the second thing is, uh, it was criticized before in the uh, discussions uh, that we had here before, that Namibia doesn't have uh, geologically, um, no, uh, geographically an advantage in terms of uh, supplying our uh, green hydrogen to, let's say, Europe. Uh, there is Morocco quite much closer. Uh, is there really a, um, a competitive uh, advantage? Thank you. Maybe let me take the, the last question first. Um, um, when, it, when it comes to green hydrogen-based uh, products, we see, as you've seen on, on my slides, we, we, are, we are not just talking green hydrogen, we are talking a number of derived products, ammonia, steel and so on and so forth. Um, there is a substantial demand for, for green ammonia in its own rights, A, in the fertilizer uh, um, uh, industry that needs to decarbonize, and then new ammonia demand in the shipping industry. Um, if the entire shipping industry is converted to ammonia, it would mean a quadrupling of today's ammonia demand. Um, um, once you are in the ammonia space, and once you are um, once you are in the ammonia vector, and you are transporting ammonia across the globe, then both the economic as well as the carbon footprint impact of transporting ammonia is very small compared to the production cost of the ammonia. So that's why this this uh, perceived disadvantage of Namibia of its geographical location isn't really a disadvantage because once you are in an ammonia ship, it it, it doesn't matter that much. The logistics cost is not the, the main driver of the, of, the, of the cost of the delivered product. Um, for straight hydrogen, straight hydrogen delivered 
into Europe, say, as an off-taker. Of course, Morocco has a huge advantage because straight hydrogen, you can pump via a pipeline from Morocco into Europe. But that's not the space that Namibia is competing uh, with. It's not about delivering straight hydrogen. It's derived products, uh, ammonia to start with, steel later on, and, and potentially aviation fuel and other products. Um, on your first question with the, 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 the tax question, Ring, rings a bell with me. It's a, it's a, I know it's a different context, but it reminds me of one of your questions. What is the benefit for, for, for Namibia? Of course, in the, Namibian, the Namibian government will ultimately be, um, be joint equity investor into the project. So, so um, uh, benefits from the project will come through multiple, multiple profits. So one, of, one of which, and a very important one, is equity investment. And if the Namib now I can't speak on behalf of the Namibian government, but if the Namibian government gets the, 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 the financing for that equity portion through concessional financing to government to government uh, um, financing, then it's, it's really, uh, it will be a great, great position to be in, let's say, as Namibia. But your question was around the offtake and the offtake that is being created through regulatory intervention and through greening of the, of the and how sustainable that is. Well, uh, we, we believe, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a reason why not just us, but many other countries, CWP and many, many uh, comp uh, uh, companies across the globe are, are investing a lot in building the capacities and the capabilities to supply the world with green hydrogen because uh, I think we are beyond the point of return where, where some, some individual country could, could, could turn direction and say, now we don't want to be carbon neutral anymore. I think we are beyond that point. The only question is how quickly will this evolve? Um, and then, so in the first, let's say in the next 10 years, there will still be a premium payable for green products. And that premium must be paid by, um, uh, by, by off takers that are exposed to regulatory regimes, like you mentioned, like in Europe or in the US or in Japan, where they are forced to buy the green and pay more for it. Um, so yes, there is a government intervention that, that creates that market. But we strongly believe that with the cost decline that we've seen on solar and wind, the same we, we will see happening on the electrolyzer side. So we will be very, very quickly, probably in the next 10 years, in a situation where green ammonia is not more expensive than gray ammonia anymore. It's the same as electricity. You know, on the electricity side, we are, we are, we are not in a space anymore where wind and solar is more expensive than coal-based power. It's actually cheaper. Yeah? So it's, it, it doesn't cost money to decarbonize the electricity sector. The only reason why there are many, many countries, and we don't, don't, don't just have to look to South Africa, many other countries in the world that are very dependent on coal um, are not decarbonizing, despite the fact that solar and wind are cheaper. Well, but that has other reasons. It's not economic reasons. It's, it's inertia, incumbent inertia, certain industries that have gr grown over many, many decades around coal supply infrastructure. And we have to, we, we are, and, and, and we, we as a company, not just in Hyphen, but, but beyond uh, Hyphen, we very actively work in all, in all, the, um, in all the areas that are, um, that are subject to very significant structural change, mostly the coal regions. Um, also uh, very, very interested to, to talk, to, talk to, to a professor about uh, the implications for, um, uh, for for Namibians uh, uh, on the um, uh, on the on the skills side, on the the type of skills that we require, uh, masters, bachelors, technicians, all the different levels, um, and and the implications of the industry that is being created for structural change. Uh, structural change in the region where we are look is, is a structural change where where industry is created, but in in coal regions, which I mean that's an advantage that, that Namibia has to to some extent that that there is. There is no incumbent coal-based industry. It is. It is. It can be extremely painful to to move an industry that has built itself around so many decades into a new in, into a new primary energy source. Um, we we work in the coal sectors in Germany. We work in the coal sectors in Pumalanga in South Africa. We work in the coal sector in Poland. Um, it's. There, there are many, many benefits that come from renewables on the job creation side, on the local value add, but it's, uh, but it's still, um, uh, you have to work extremely closely with the industries and the communities that have built livelihoods around a certain industry structure. And that is not easy uh, uh, to, uh, to work with. It's, it's definitely something that we have to do, not just we as a company, but we as society. Um, strongly believe that there's, there will be no transition if, if, there, 
or there, there's only a transition if we manage to achieve no losers during the transition. That's super important, otherwise there will be no transition. Sorry, I remember the uh, geographical question as well from the last session. And, and the one thing I think um, some of us are missing that's useful to think about is, you know, Europe is sort of the obvious destination because we're talking about it the whole time. One has to remember South Africa is the 10th largest emitter of carbon in the world. They account for almost, you know, depending on the numbers you look at, from half to 33% of the continent's emissions. Um, Sasol produces 2.5 million tons of gray hydrogen. Their first project is 300,000 tons. They're saying that whole area, maybe we can make 3 million tons. Just Sasol needs 2.5 million tons of, gray, of green hydrogen in order to decarbonize their operation. Um, so Morocco doesn't have that as a next door neighbor, but we do. We don't even have to ship the hydrogen to South Africa. We can pipe it to South Africa. And piping is the cheapest method of transporting hydrogen. So Namibia actually has two or three markets that, are, that we're exploring at the moment. South Africa, there were like six or seven people from Sasol here last week. Sasol bid as one of the RFP bidders last year. Okay, so that's a pretty obvious market. You're getting Imperial, which is the largest consumer of diesel in Africa. 150 million liters of diesel. And they want to give six hydrogen trucks to the CMB ONL partnership that we announced on Tuesday to begin to decarbonize the trading route between South Africa and Namibia. And folks aren't thinking about that. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement provides a very interesting and unique opportunity for Namibia to trade molecules within the continent and electrons as well, as some of you had mentioned. Um, and we, you know, a lot of that is captured in this website that I'd really love for you guys to visit, gh2namibia.com. There's a lot of material we put up there, some from Hyphen, some from other sources, and we're trying to articulate these opportunities in that website. And we'll do more of this as well to make sure that you're problem solving for opportunities that are available to you today. You know, we don't have to wait five or 10 years as we were being told the last time you had this discussion. Um, ONL is deploying capital today. Um, I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to say this. Clemens wants to build infrastructure between Cape Town and Namibia today. Okay, I won't say what infrastructure, but you know, there are people looking at doing this right now. Um, and we're giving grant funding today. Like, what is that? 30 million years. That's like 530, half a billion Namibian dollars. We're availing on Friday for you and other entrepreneurs in Namibia and around the world to start deploying your problem-solving skills to today. So, so South Africa is one, Europe is the obvious one, we're in talks with them, but we started talking to Japan. I've just texted Marco and I'll send it to all of you. Uh, there's a Japanese power producer who wants half a million tons of ammonia. They're saying it's the first real producer who's actually gone out there and is looking for product versus developers looking for a producer. Japan has called us on two levels, from a government perspective and from a private sector player perspective and from a funder's perspective as well. And their rationality is they're saying, of course, they'd love to get a lot of their you know, molecules from Australia. That's the main source. But they've also been trialing molecules from Saudi Arabia. But they're saying Saudi Arabia and Australia have their own industries that they want to decarbonize. And they don't think they'll get enough molecules from those two countries. And they'd love to diversify their source of energy into Namibia. And so as, as Marco mentioned, you know, transporting some of these more complex products, the transport card is not, is not a big part of the total cost. And so if you're Namibian, the, the world is kind of actually honestly your oyster, especially if you get your cost of capital down and you deal with your environmental issues as well. So I just wanted to provide that context because I, I know I heard it the last time and I was like, I need to broaden your horizons a little bit. That the, the world is really looking for these molecules and they're not as easy to come by as, as one would think. And of course, a lot of you would know that we have biomass as well. And, and if that becomes a sustainable source of carbon, you can make very complex products with a Fischer-Tropsch system. Um, and, and, and that I know Tobias has mentioned as well. So hydrogen and ammonia are potentially the tip of the iceberg of what we can do with, with the natural resource that we have in the Tsao Cape National Park.
So here's one question from the the um, Zoom people. The part on how Hyphen plans to fund the project has not really been covered yet. Your finances will ultimately determine whether your project will be funded. My question is, what do your likely finances have to say about the Namibian government's recent policy initiatives, including MIPA and NIF, both of which could have a big influence on foreign direct investment if they were passed? So I'm not going to talk specifically to um, NIPA and, and NIF. I think what we have discussed with government is about an enabling legislation it, uh, to encompass what will be a hydrogen industry in Namibia. Every country has conflicting policies. Every country has uh, conflicting um, priorities. And I think what you've clearly seen from the Namibian government and what has attracted us to Namibia is that when it comes to hydrogen, there is absolute certainty and clarity of where the country would like to go. And, the, and what we've seen from government as a private investor is government coalescing around a solution, an, a solution orientated um, partnership with the industry where, the, where, where Namibia and her people are the ultimate owners and beneficiaries of this industry. So we see government receiving royalties, receiving taxes, receiving environmental levies directly from the project, working together with industry to look at how do we address some of the questions raised by the professor around uh, jobs uh, creation, skills development. We had a very constructive meeting yesterday, the first kickoff of our social economic work stream with government to identify how we as a collective will look to start to um, address some of those social issues. And there will be social issues that a project of the scale will, will, will bring. I think you'll end up in a position in Namibia where net immigration into Namibia will be a challenge. So that needs to be identified now as a potential policy um, area so that the, the, the programs and the, and the protections can be put in place in order to manage that. So I think what Namibia has as a benefit in embarking on this journey is if we look at global large-scale infrastructure resource-based projects, particularly on the African continent, and use those as a yardstick and a measuring, uh, as a measuring device of what can go wrong and the policies that you need to identify in advance to ensure that they don't go wrong in Namibia, I think that for us is very, very um, for, forefront and center of uh, government's mind. And issues of how we will, um, as a collective, craft this um, enabling legislation in, in Namibia to enable not only Hafen, but the future um, projects that will come behind us is, uh, is, is the most critical thing that, that we will, will do. We've got an enormous responsibility as a first project to ensure that together with government, we enable this infrastructure in a sustainable way, in a scalable way. The world needs this to scale on an enormous level. The questions around um, demand, the problem is not going to be where are the customers? The problem is going to be how the heck do we, as a, as a global community, produce enough of this stuff in order to meet the carbon reduction targets? Just the shipping industry will take 150 million tons. There are shipping companies today who are building ships for green hydrogen without any supply. There are certain shipping companies that could take twice the amount of hydrogen that um, nitrogen, uh, sorry, uh, ammonia that we'll, we'll produce. It, the, the, the size of the market is truly, truly going to be enormous. And we think Namibia can play an enormous role in, in capturing a large proportion of that, or a reasonable proportion of that market size and benefit as a, as a country and address some of the social issues that uh, have been identified. Thank you. Uh, to attain potable water, used as an input into the hydrogen production process, the understanding is that desalination plants will have to be constructed near the coastal regions. Considering Namibia's current account, fishing contributes a sizable portion of Namibia's net export. How will the toxic byproduct concentrated salt ejected from these plants be managed not to disrupt the fishing industry in these regions, given the large volumes demand for potable water in the hydrogen production process? So it's actually quite a common misconception around how much water is actually required to make a kg of hydrogen. It's nine liters or nine kgs of water to make one kg of hydrogen. It's a very small percentage compared to a, um, a large scale deep desalination plant. So if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, has got one of the largest desalination plants. What we would need to do, the three, um, three million tons of hydrogen production is probably a tenth of the size of 
the largest uh, desalination plant in the world. This ultimately comes down to the engineering solutions that we will be deployed. There's a strong Benguela current that runs runs up the uh, west coast, uh, past of uh, past Luderitz, and the idea would be to make use of that current in order to ensure the dispersion or dispersion of the brine into the into the uh, ocean, so that it disperses disperses very quickly, so you do not have concentration uh, buildups. Also on the on the conservation side, besides the need to preserve the conservatory area, would other environmental risks impacts were considered for project of such a magnitude, and how does Hafen intend to mitigate such risks? I'm not too sure what the question is trying to um, yeah in, environmental risks in general. Um, so if, in terms of the process. Uh, in socially environmentally responsible investment uh, is regulated globally. As investors in a country, this is this will not be a Namibian decision around what will be approved or not approved. This will be regulated by the global investment community. Uh, the IFC is the um, arbiter of what is considered the gold standard in social, in uh, social and environmentally sensitive investment. Um, and there are a set of principles and guidelines that the IFC mandates, which all international lenders of scale apply um, will, will apply in evaluating a project. It is our intention um, to comply with those requirements and produce the project in a socially and environmentally responsible way. There's a whole process that we need to embark upon in order to do that. Uh, we have appointed environmental consultants, and as the project unfolds, we will be engaging in far more of these uh, open open forums where we will engage with with uh, interested and affected parties, the fishing communities, uh, uh, people who are interested in brown ahina, uh, the environment, uh, people who've got environmental concessions. For the world, in order to decarbonize, an enormous amount of land is required. That requires, and projects of this scale has never been done anywhere in the world. It requires an enormous amount of land to save the very environment that we all love the environment is going to have to work together with projects, in our view, in order to achieve that achieve that balance. So the Saar Kaheb is a as a region. Um, I was staggered when I saw that it was only 50 milliliters of uh, millimeters of rainwater a year in that area. Most of the rain, most of the water coming from from the fog belt. Um, if you look at how we've designed our, our project, uh, as we start moving through the environmental process, you'll see. So there's there's we've already identified where the most sensitive areas are. That needs to be ground truth. But for example, if you look along the coastal line, where we know the bird migratory paths on, where where um, where there's nesting grounds, we are well away from those. We don't even consider those as uh, potential sites for investment. They just get a big cross through them. The investment will be focused, or development will be focused on those areas that have the least environmental sensitivity. Thank you so much. I want to ask about a company, HDF Energy, a French company who sent today to me um, a call for, it was not them that sent it, it was SLR Environmental Consulting for running an EIA for uh, power to hydrogen to power infrastructure near Swakopmund. How does that fit in with this whole project? Do you know the details? Why is there an EIA done on this one? And we haven't yet heard of the other one. Just some background, please. So I'm not specific. I, we obviously know who HDF is. I'm not specifically aware of that of that project. Um, I would imagine it, it comes down to a question of scale and relatively small projects in a less environmentally sensitive areas can proceed much faster than a project of, of this scale, uh, where you're looking at deploying tens of millions of dollars versus tens of billions of dollars, the, um, the process that you follow, follow is very, very different. We also, our, the process that we're engaging in is a government-led process. It's government land. Government has run the tender process. Um, I would assume that, that that project is located on on private land and therefore uh, the process that they would go through would be somewhat different to ours. Yeah, so HDF is looking to develop a project in the Irongo region with a Swakop municipality in Irongo Red and they've gotten land uh, from the Swakop municipality to do that. Um, so just like Marco said, that's you know, uh, regional uh, local authority land, um, smaller than theirs. But what is useful, I think, for you to consider is the proliferation of the technology 
and how it's now beginning to run its course through our country. And I think as a scientific society, you need to start thinking about what that means. Um, HDF is deploying a technology they call Renew Stable. It's a containerized hydrogen solution that will obviously use renewable energy, uh, solar panels and ETC to create the electricity, but then they'll use the hydrogen to create a, a fairly stable signature of power so they can use some of the hydrogen at night ETC. Um, but you know that begins to provide potentially um, dispatchable power that has a very renewable um, electricity profile in terms of its carbon emissions. And so, you know, if you're a small municipality, that begins to look like a very attractive option, but that's also hydrogen, right? So, the, you know, when we say to, to Professor Dupisani's point, this is not about this green hydrogen project. Mm -hmm. It's about a global movement towards reducing our carbon footprint. This is kind of what we were, we were saying. So, of course, hopefully soon you'll be getting an EAA request for the pilot project from CMB and ONL and many others will come as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. And I think with this, we can slowly but surely come to the end. I want to make one more comment that adds to Professor Dupizani's point, and that is um, I want to repeat the resources in expertise that Namibia has. He mentioned those many, many youngsters that are qualified that cannot find jobs. I want to go a step further and talk about our kids that left the country. They are all between 30 and 40, and they did not come back because they were at that stage overqualified, as you would call it. Namibia could just not offer the opportunities. Now that they've grown up and they are coming to 40 years of age, they want to come home. So it would be a very good idea to post a call for Namibians to submit their qualifications, tell us where they are. Scientific Society has one initiative going of 120 youngsters that are invited for meeting, for connecting, for interacting, for being in touch. That's upon the invitation of the CEO. And as I said, these are 120 kids on my list who have either an academic qualification and it must be postgraduate, or they've achieved something building a company, running a social project or so. Some have left again to Oxford and Cambridge and wherever, but they are there. And this is a resource that we have. We need not go through home affairs. They have Namibian citizenship. They have the passion for the country. They want to be involved. They want to, as I said, come home and make an effort to keep Namibia steady and going. And whenever you do sign, um, um, are ready to sign up jobs, et cetera, et cetera, do send them to Namibia Scientific Society, to do post them on the Bright Minds page, to put them on the Facebook page and give Namibians preference. I mean, obviously they will have to prove their performance and this is on another level, but yes. I so much want to thank you. This is exactly what we want. I'll come back to you just now. And all these little things popping up, as I said, there's a company there and there's something there and we get a bit uneasy. What's happening makes us so much appreciate the transparency that such a project brings. And it would be good if we could on a continuous basis, for instance, be updated and have talks on how far are we, what are the needs, what are the challenges, where can the Namibian people be involved in making this world work so that there are no losers. Yeah, I, th I think you, you raise a really good point and, and so did Professor Dupisani. Um, and, and again, sort of, you know, the government has, has um, given various updates on NBC, on Facebook, ETC, about this program that we're running. So Sherilyn over here is an example of a Namibian who left to Stellenbosch, came back, and instead of going to work for one of you guys and earn a lot of money, she works in the presidency. She will not get a pay increase anytime soon. Um, but she is running a 5 million euro scholarship program, 75 million Namibian bucks for the next five years. And her job, together with anyone here who's really willing to attract young capital into this industry is to find bright scholars uh, who are ab abroad and, and you know, who want to come back. Um, but, you know, I think what I would really love to implore somebody, you know, a society like the Namibian Scientific Society, Sherilyn is an electrical engineer. 
right? But she works for government. Um, and you kind of have to recognize that there are people like her in government who would like to work with people like you. And we would love to be invited to talk to you about bringing more Namibians back home. Franz Kalenga is another example of a Namibian who left, went to Russia, has got law degrees, MBAs, and is back and he's working within the Namibian government and he's now a special assistant to the Minister of Mines and Energy and he's helping stitch all of this together. So there are plenty examples of Namibians. I'm one of them. I left, I went to Cape Town, I went to Joburg, I went to Harvard, but I came back as well. And as you know, I also stopped working for the private sector and I went back into government to try and create the sort of capacity that we need to turn the country around. So, so I sort of heard the concerns from all of you and Professor Dupisani, but colleagues, we won't fix it unless we're willing to roll up our sleeves and work together um, and really have that impact. So Sherilyn is working on that scholarship program. Uh, Professor Kaufman from BMBF is helping Sherilyn put that program together. The EU is helping Sherilyn put that program together. Hyphen is going to help us as government put together an internship program where they could start absorbing Namibians as early as this year. And if we go through the EIA, they, we will develop a program where students can you know, work part-time and study part-time as well. So I think the message is the government, by the way, one more thing that we did when we were designing all this, other than also reaching out to the private sector and asking them to form an association to help us conceive an industry that is conducive for all of you, we also went to the educational institutions and we formed the Namibian Green Hydrogen Research Institute. And we encouraged NAST and Polytech to come together to put a national academic institution that would champion the intellectual capital around this particular industry. The Scientific Society of Namibia should go support NAST and Polytech, uh, NAST and, uh, and UNAM, right? Give, give them your expertise, give them funding, collaborate with them and help Sherilyn design her program so that she's not doing it alone. We've, we've done our bit as government. You know, we've given the ideas, they're public. We're getting people calling us from Russia, China, everywhere in the world. But you didn't even invite us. We invited ourselves to you. I saw you guys in your last session. I said, guys, like, why aren't you talking to us? So you didn't invite us, we came to you. Um, and in future, invite us, let's work together. It's our country, we love our kids, we love our nature. So, so that's my plea to you, but I'd end off on a positive note and saying thank you so much for hosting us. Under the Stars, a very romantic setting to talk about how we're gonna reconstruct our country together, holding hands, that's the only way it should be done. So thank you very much for having us, I'm very humble, thanks. To come back to your question, um, our vice chairman is the astrophysics lecturer at UNAM. And one of our highly esteemed members whose book we um, published is Dr. Andrew Nikondo. You will probably know his position in NAST. So yes, we do work together with UNAM and NAST and we have MOUs with like Obabab Training Center. By the way, they'll have their six years anniversary and then maybe our scientific society was of the initiator of that Desert Research Foundation 60 years ago. So, so sorry to take the floor, but we are talking about very important thing, uh, skills, training and education and coming now i'm from the european union ambassador and please know erasmus plus is new and bigger uh, student and university mobility program you need a lot of skilled people now at different levels and it's not anymore only university level uh, education also vocational training now so please uh, talk to you or your universities to make a university uh, uh, twinning with the European universities and get uh, funding from Erasmus Plus. Thank you so much. And then to your second question, why have we not invited you? To be very honest, we are a platform that has no preferences and we learned that it's a bit difficult to get a response from government. So we've been waiting 
for those that are ready to talk to us to come. We, for instance, have very good connections to the research director of the Ministry of Water and um, Tourism and Environment. And we are too happy to now have this connection also. And we are so glad that you come, came and we've been waiting for you because we always sit. So when will government come and participate and use the platform to bring up the um, thing? And I think this is a very good start and it makes me happy, it makes me grateful because the concern, and it's not only my concern, but many of, of my fellow Namibians was that with the hyphen project, as we all call, um, call it, an enclave would be built. And it was mentioned in one of the previous presentations, you've got this island in the country where people fly in and they have every commodity that they would love and they fly out again and they never knew they are in Africa, that type of thing. And now we actually are happy to hear that Namibians will be involved and that we do have an opportunity and that it is in fact our project future development as well. And with this, I want to once again say this is a platform for communication, for putting the facts on the table. Thank you so much for being transparent, for giving us the details. The presentations will be available. We take a few days, two, three, four days. Then it will be up on our website as a YouTube video. We would like to have your permission to hand out the slides. If there are people who want to ask, if you are available, may we give your contact details, especially James. Thank you so much. And I really hope you become a member of the society and we see you here again. And the same for you. Thank you so, so much.